Hello and welcome to GST Key Masterclass. Today is the first GST Masterclass in English and the fourth one in the entire sequence of Masterclasses on GST that have been held so far. And the subject today is Registration and Migration to GST Regime. Frequently asked questions uh, that have been sent on social media with the hashtag Ask Adya have been selected in advance by finance ministry officials. And uh, today, an esteemed panel of guests is with us. They are senior uh, finance ministry officials. They'll be asking, the f they'll be answering, in fact, the frequently asked questions that have come on social media. Let me introduce them to you. Hasmuk Adya, Revenue Secretary, is with us. So is uh, Mr. P.K. Jain, Chief Commissioner of CBEC and Prakash Kumar, CEO, GSTN. To tell you a little about the format of today's session, there will be a brief presentation by Revenue Secretary Hasmok Adia and by the CEO of GSTN, uh, Mr. Kumar, and that will be followed by FAQs being answered by uh, the Finance Ministry officials and GSTN uh, official, and uh, after that, the floor will be open to questions. So let's get started with the presentation. Mr. Adia. Thank you very much, Munmun. First of all, I would also like to extend my warm welcome to all those people who are gathered here, as well as those who are watching us online everywhere. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the Press Information Bureau and the Doordarshan, uh, which have taken this initiative of disseminating knowledge on GST to various small traders, big traders, tax practitioners, and also to government officials. It's been a wonderful experience so far. A uh, lot of other channels also are carrying these episodes and I'm thankful to them also for sending this message to lakhs and lakhs of people through this initiative. Uh, the three classes which we have taken in the GST master class were all in Hindi. And this class is a series of three classes, again on the same subject but in English. The first class is on registration and migration from VAT to GST, from service tax to GST, and also on the issue relating to GSTN, how to handle the GSTN related issues of registration, et cetera. Uh, those of you who have already watched uh, class one of the master class in Hindi, they need not watch this because there's a repetition of the same thing in English. We'll start with a small presentation uh, and uh, this presentation will tell you basically who all are supposed to register for GST, who all are excluded from registration of GST, how to register yourself online, and what are the modalities connected with the registration that you have to follow. So this is a complete presentation on registration. In fact, I can confidently say that those of you who follow this presentation and also listen to the questions and answers session, they will not need anybody's help for doing registration. They can do it themselves. But at the most, if they have any fear, they can take the help of a IT graduate who knows a little bit of IT, how to handle computer, and they will be able to register themselves online. So this is such a simple thing. So we'll move on to the presentation. The first thing is, who is supposed to register under GST? Anybody whose turnover is about 20 lakhs for a year. Now this we calculate with reference to the last year. So if you are already a dealer last year, and if you are, if you are trading volume, or if your manufacturing turnover was about 20 lakhs last year, then you are supposed to register. In case of special category states, which are hill states of Northeast, Himachal Pradesh, Uttaranchal, and Jammu and Kashmir. In case of this 11 states, other than Jammu Kashmir, because in Jammu and Kashmir, although it is a special state, it, it has got a st status of a special state, but they would themselves prefer to keep the limit of 20 lakhs. So in Jammu and Kashmir, if you are a dealer, you have to register only if your turnover last year was more than 20 lakhs. In all other special category states, the limit is 10 lakhs. So if you are having turnover more than 10 lakhs, you are supposed to register. And for rest of the country, it is 20 lakhs. When you talk about the turnover, what is it that we count in the turnover? The turnover will include not only the turnover of the taxable commodity that you are selling or manufacturing, but also the exempt commodities turnover, which you are dealing with. Also the turnover of export, and if you have done any interstate supply last year, 
then also that interstate sup supply turnover will also be counted for turnover. So it is total turnover that you have to count for the purpose of this 20 lakhs or 10 lakhs limit that you are given. The second issue is that if your turnover is less than 20 lakhs, but if you are a person or a dealer or a company supplying goods to another state or services to another state, then you are supposed to register under the GST compulsorily. So your turnover may be 10 lakhs, your turnover may be 5 lakhs, but if you want to do any interstate trade, if you have to sell goods to another state, or if you have to give services to another state, then you are supposed to take registration. This is a fundamental thing. Now what does it mean when I say that you have to take a registration? Now what, what it means is that in the state where you are selling, from, from the state where you are selling, you have to register not in the state where you are sending goods, okay? So for example, if I am a dealer based in Haryana, and if I am selling to Uttar Pradesh, then I have to register in Haryana, not in Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh, I am only sending goods. I am not selling from Uttar Pradesh. But if I have a, if I have got a branch in Uttar Pradesh, then also I have to register in Uttar Pradesh also. But if you are selling only from one place to the rest of the country, anywhere in the country, if you are sending goods or services, then you are supposed to register definitely. So the 20 lakh limit does not apply if you want to do interstate trade. So that is one thing. The second thing is ki, which I already explained, ki it is only to be done in the state from where the goods or services are supplied. So I may be an IT software company, but if I am supplying software, I am making software for the rest of the country sitting in one place, then only in that state he has to register. He can supply software sitting in one office to rest of the country, but he has to only uh, take registration in that one state. The th third category of people who are supposed to take registration is casual and non-resident taxable person. Suppose you want to register only for one time episode because you've got a box contract. You are a contractor, you've got a contract from government and government insists that you should be registered. Then you can be registered as a casual person and there also the casual person, the limit of 20 lakh doesn't apply. If you want to do one-time business, even of 10 lakhs, then you have to take registration. So there also 20 lakh limit doesn't apply. Similarly, if you are a non-resident person coming to India for a short while and you want to do business, then you are supposed to take registration, 20 lakh limit does not apply. The next is key, if you are a person defined under the law with the responsibility to pay full tax under reverse charge, full tax under reverse charge. For example, there are certain category of people we have defined. If you are taking the transport service, uh, if you are giving the transport service, then the, risk, uh, the, the responsibility is on the transport aggregator. So in that case, the transport aggregator has to take the registration. And if you are an electronic commerce operator, if you are having a e-commerce company or e-commerce, you are dealing in e-commerce, then also the e-commerce company, which is an electronic commerce aggregator, they also have to take compulsory registration. And lastly, if you are an agent of somebody, then also you are supposed to take registration as an agent because agent and principal relationship also has to be clarified. So those, those are the categories of people who are supposed to take uh, registration. Now who are the people who don't have to take registration? There are three categories of people here. First is the person who is engaged exclusively in exempt supply, non-taxable supply. So for example, there are a lot of commodities which are exempt. We have given a full list in the newspaper through an advertisement. Suppose milk, milk is totally exempt. So if you are doing trading of milk only, then you don't have to register. You may be doing 100 crore of turnover of milk, but if it is the only item you are selling, then you don't have to register. You may be selling food grains which are in loose and not branded food wear, branded food. Then also food items are all exempt category other than branded and in packed condition. So that also, if you are only dealing in that, you don't have to register. If you are simply dealing in petrol diesel and not selling any lubricant at the petrol pump, because lubricants, et cetera, are taxable under GST. 
but petrol diesel are not taxable petrol diesel natural gas are not taxable so if you are dealing in those things only then you don't have to register but along with the petrol and diesel sale if you are keeping some lubricants to sell you have to register under gst second category if you are an agriculturist and you are growing something on the land that kind of an agriculturist so then also as an agriculturist your turnover may be more than a crore but then also you don't have to take registration so as an agriculturist whatever amount of goods you sell in the market you don't have to take registration wherever there is a tax on commercial crop production those taxation is also in the reverse charge on the dealer or the trader who will be purchasing it so the agriculturist per se those who are cultivating the uh, crops for them it is not compulsory to register they may not have to take registration and finally of course those who are engaged exclusively in, exclusively in supplies which are under reverse charge mechanism so if you have a responsibility to uh, pay under reverse charge mechanism compulsorily then you have to register okay so those are the items uh, which are uh, compulsory uh, the, sorry those are the items sorry you don't have to take registration in this case suppose there is an item on which the tax is payable only in reverse charge okay then you don't have to take registration you are the one who is giving services or goods but the taxability is on the reverse charge only in that item in which case you don't have to take registration then finally of course uh, the next is that what are the details uh, of registration how do you take registration the first thing is that all registrations are pan based which means permanent account number of income tax is a must for taking registration under gst so your gst number itself will be having pan contained into the number itself so everybody who has got a pan only can take gst registration anybody who has got a pan can only take gst registration the second thing is ki if you are actually doing business from more than one state i'm not saying in more than one state from more than one state then in every single state where you are doing business from you can take register you have to take registration so if you got a branch in some other state from where also you are selling your goods you are storing your goods there you got a warehouse in another state and you are also dispatching or selling goods from there you have to take registration in that state also right but as i explained earlier if you are simply sending goods to other states or giving services to other states that itself is not good enough reason for you to register in other states you have to only register in one state in that case the third thing is ki in one state with one pan you can take only one registration normally one pan one registration so you cannot split your units artificially but if there are good enough reasons for you to split them you have to apply for it you have to take more than one registration for business verticals so you may be running three different types of business you are also selling crackers in the diwali season you are also selling uh, say agro commodities throughout the year and you may be also having a petrol pump so if you got three business vertical you can ask for separate number for each one of them but there are cost that there, there are issues involved with that the moment you register them at separately in one state itself the transactions which are taking place between this two different entities of the same person will attract tax so you have to then sort of treat them as independent units and if your own unit is buying or selling good to another unit of yours then the tax has to be paid so you have to keep it in mind while you ask for registration in one state for more than one business so that is something which can be done in every registration you have to give one principal place of business where all your records are supposed to be there and then you are also supposed to give additional place of business in the registration form which you can give uh, at the time of registration any number of additional place of business you can give so wherever there is a go down of yours wherever there is a branch office of, your, of yours at all this place uh, for all these places you have to give the details in the registration form 
And finally, registration should be taken within 30 days of starting the business. So you can start the business to begin with if you are in a hurry to start the business, but you have to apply and get a registration number within 30 days. So there are certain businesses which were not under VAT or excise duty prior to 1st of July. Now all those businesses which were earlier not in the GST net, in the VAT or excise net, they are not migrated. They have to take new registration for the first time. For this people, the time available is only one month. So they should immediately apply and get a registration number before 30th of July. Otherwise, they will be penalized for doing their business without registration and their business can also be stopped. So it's something which all this kind of traders who are for the first time coming into the tax net, they should remember that they have to apply in time and they have to take a registration within 30 days. Next. Uh, in the, uh, yeah, sorry. In the registration, there are core fields and there are other fields. There are three core fields which you are supposed to fill up. One is the legal name of business. So you can say Ram and Company, Shyam and Company, Rahim and Company, whatever name you want to give. That is your name of the business. The second is address of principal and additional place of business. Now these are core fields. And the third is addition, deletion, retirement of partners or directors. So whenever there is a change in the composition of the firm, or in the composition of the board of directors of the company, or in the ownership, etc., then you have to give details on, on this. Now, these are the three fields which you cannot change yourself. These are called core fields of uh, uh, item, core fields of information. For changing this field, you have to go to the tax authority to which you are assigned. And you have to request, Kibai, I want to change my ownership structure. I want to change the name of my business. These are the things which cannot be changed automatically by you. The tax authority has to approve your changes in this three core fields. Other than this, all other fields which are there, for example, the name of your bank, bank account, you can change your bank account yourself. And these changes can be made, the other fields can be changed by you yourself anytime. So this is something which uh, you must remember. Next. You can also take voluntary registration. You may be below 20 lakhs, but if you wish to, you can take voluntary registration. But what are the pros and cons of this? The benefit of this is that if you are registered, your turnover comes on the record, that is one. Second is key, you can do B2B transaction also. Because normally in B2B transaction, where you are selling your product to another business, that particular business will require input tax credit to be taken for this purchase. And so if you are registered, and if you have paid the tax on that item, then he will not have the hassle of paying the same tax in reverse charge mechanism. So he would always prefer, the B2B person would always prefer to buy from a person who is registered. So it is always advisable to register so that you can sell goods to B2B. B2C it is okay, B2C because the consumers don't need any input tax credit. So you can be below 20 lakhs and you may not register, that's fine. The second benefit, as I told you, the registered dealer will not have to pay tax in reverse charge. If you are selling in B2B, the other person doesn't have to pay in reverse charge. What are the minus points of registering voluntarily? One, once you are registered, you are supposed to pay tax on the entire turnover. You cannot then claim exemption of 20 lakhs. Once you are registered, even if your turnover is one, one lakh rupees or five lakh rupees or 10 lakh rupees, whatever turnover you have, on that you are supposed to pay tax. So that is one thing. And secondly, key, even if there is nil transaction during the month, you are supposed to file your return in time. Now that is something which is another disadvantage with voluntary registration, but you have to weigh the pros and cons of this. Now, this is the broad legal conceptual framework of the law and the rules that I explained to you. The main thing is, uh, is how do you register online on the GST portal? What is the procedure for it? What is the mechanism for it? What is the mechanism for modifying the detail that you are given in your GST registration form? 
and what are the various issues associated with this and what kind of a uh, uh, IT problems are you facing? All those things uh, Prakash will uh, cover in his uh, presentation. I'll request Prakash Kumar to now take over. Uh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> so you heard the legal <laughs> aspects. Now I'll just take you through the GST portal, which has been created for registration, payment, return filing, and integrated GST settlement data processing. Now what was being done till 30th June on VAT portal of 29 states, seven union territories, and the portal of service tax and central excise will get done at one place. So there is one portal for the whole country for all GST taxpayers. You must have heard two different terms. One is enrollment, <coughs> migration, and also now new registration. So my endeavor here will be to just tell you about more about what these terms are and how we do these processes on the GST portal. Next. So enrollment is essentially for those who are already registered under state VAT, service tax, central excise, and other taxes which have been subsumed under GST. So the government started this enrollment process on 8th of November by issuing provisional ID at that time based on the TIN, tax identification number under then existing taxes, and the PAN. So these were the two things which were required, and a provisional ID was generated and shared with the tax authorities for onward sharing with the taxpayers. There is no fee charged for enrollment or the migration. And if one goes through the manual or the FAQs and is ready with documents, it doesn't take more than 10 to 15 minutes to fill up the entire uh, form. Now, <clears throat> what is required to be done? One is what we call enrollment. Once you get your provisional ID and the token from your tax authority, you need to activate it. And that is what uh, is called in common parlance as enrollment. So one has to go to the portal, gst.gov.in, use the provisional ID which has been given, and the token. And after that, the system will ask for a mobile number and an email ID on which OTPs will be sent. Once you fill up the OTPs which were sent on both, email as well as mobile, then the system basically enrolls you. Now what is this uh, provisional ID? Provisional ID is nothing but your GST identification number. At that time it was called provisional ID because there was, law was, had not come into effect. Now what are the documents required for filling up part B of the form? Which is basically your business details, details of the promoters or partners, your uh, principal place of business, bank account, and things of that sort. And these are basically the photographs of all the promoters. There are sizes given there, like 100 KB maximum for photo, for constitution of business, one MB. And all one needs to do is to keep them ready, scan it, bring them to size. One problem which many people faced in the, in the initial period was how to reduce this. So when you scan, there is something called DPI on your uh, scanner, just choose a lower DPI and you'll be able to bring your document to this size. Once you have done this, your migration part is also complete for after the ARN is issued and I'll just talk you, take you through that next process. Now, <clears throat> till yesterday, a total of 86,61,000 existing, then existing taxpayers were issued provisional ID. So these provisional IDs are with the tax departments and they have shared with the tax res respective taxpayers. Out of that, 69.32 lakhs have already enrolled, which means they have come and they have activated their provisional ID, they have given their email, mobile number, etc. And based on this, we have generated provisional certificate and sent it, sent it by email. It's also available on their 
dashboard. So if they log in, they can see and they can download this provisional certificate which needs to be displayed in their place of business. Now out of this 69.32 lakhs, 38.5 have also completed part B. The part B is the one which you fill up, which are those business details, promoters details, etc. Then you become eligible for permanent registration certificate, what we call RC, so that you can continue your business without any challenge. So we have still around 30.8 lakh taxpayers who, have, who are yet to complete Part B, and we are now sending them uh, emails and SMSs, ask, requesting them to come to the portal along with those documents, fill up Part B, and sign the application. Now, signing the application is basically when you sign on a paper that the information provided is true to my best of my knowledge, et cetera. Similar kind of thing you do here. But then this authentication has to be done by digital signature certificate in case of companies, LLPs, and foreign LLPs. And for others, government has introduced electronic verification code where OTP is sent on the mobile number which you had registered earlier. Just give the OTP and then your signing process gets completed. Now this was with, so far as the enrollment process was concerned. For those taxpayers who were already registered prior to 30th June under various laws like VAT, service tax, central excise, and they have been transitioned or migrate, migrated to the new law. Lots of people have uh, started making a new registration and let me just take you through the new registration process, which is quite similar to enrollment format as well. And again, one has to go to the same portal, gst.gov.in, and what they need to have is PAN, a mobile number, and an email ID with them, a working email ID. So you just go there, give your PAN, give the mobile number, and give the email ID. A OTP will be sent to both. And this is basically to validate both the things, your mobile number as well as email ID so that in future we can communicate with you. Simultaneously, the PAN is also validated with Central Board of Direct, Direct Taxes with the income tax database. Once that is found okay, a temporary registration number is, temporary reference number is given and that is what you take and go and fill up the next one. The next one, you have to fill up the same items what I explained earlier uh, while uh, explaining the enrollment. It's basically your business details, promoter's details, uh, principal place of business, if you have additional places, additional place of business, bank account, etc. And then once you fill them up, you sign them. Once you sign, the system gives ARN. Now ARN is generated after the PAN of the promoters or the directors is validated. Or in case of companies, the directors, the SIN and DIN is also validated online by the system. So in case there is an error, you get a message called validation error. And also an email goes to your registered email ID stating that these things have not been validated. Suppose a one particular promoter's PAN is not matching with that, with the income tax database, so there will be a validation error. And the email will say that this PAN, this particular promoter's PAN did not. So what do you do? You go back to the portal and correct that so that you can, your uh, validation gets through. Now once it has been, you have got the ARN, which means every, all validations have been through, then the application, registration application will be shared with the respective tax authority. Now he gets three working days. Now working days is important here. Saturdays and Sundays are not included and similarly local holidays are not included. I mean holiday as holidays are not included. So he gets a time to go through all the documents. He will go through the uh, lease deed, etc., which has been uploaded and whatever other information which has been provided. If he wants to know something out of the information which has been provided or some document is not legible, he can raise a query. And he can ask to supply a new document 
or a clear copy of the document or could be like your lease, do lease deed was had expired. So he will ask you to give a new lease document. And that is what the, op the, the taxpayer then has seven working days to file that and after that tax officer gets seven days to approve or reject. And accordingly, the taxpayer gets the permanent registration certificate. Can we go to the next one? Uh, this I have already uh, explained that the, they both of them, they get seven days, the taxpayer gets seven days to answer the query. And after that, the, once the information has been provided to the tax officer, he gets seven days. And after that, he approves, then registration certificate is issued. If he has reasons to believe, then he has to record in writing why he is rejecting the application, and that is conveyed to the applicant. Next one. Now, some of the tips which I thought I should give here for the wider audience, we have kept small two minutes, three minutes video on the GST portal. It's also available in YouTube and uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook, where step-by-step -step process how to do it is explained. So my request is all the newcomers who want to do it, please have a look at it. And in fact, you can run it simultaneously when you are filling up. Number two, keep all the documents ready as I had explained earlier. And then I'm certain you'll be able to do it in 10 to 15 minutes. While writing the name, please ensure that the name is written exactly the way it is written in PAN. If it is not written, then there will be a validation error. In case of companies, similarly, name of the company and the number, which is SIN, and case of directors, directors, DIN, directors identification number are also done, are also validated, so that should be written clearly. The next one. So <clears throat> some queries have been uh, raised here on uh, Twitter as well as in our call centers that three days have gone and I haven't got my uh, registration certificate. I just wanted to re-clarify again, there's three working days. And as I explained, if it is a, someone applies on Friday, then the Saturday and Sunday is not counted. Then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be counted. And by Wednesday evening, he has to, he will get that. And if a query is raised, please answer that query, that particular relevant part, either by providing writing information or by providing document as the case may be. Next. So that's all I had to talk about the all process. All right, Mr. Kumar and Mr. Radia, thank you for that. And several questions uh, have come on social media. So let's take them up one by one. The first uh, one is a taxable person's business is in many states. His aggregate turnover is below 20 lakhs. He makes an interstate supply from one state. Is he liable for registration? That has already been answered, that if there is an interstate supply, then there has to be registration. So we can move on to the second question. Whether a separate GSTIN would be allotted uh, to a registered person for deducting TDS, he has PAN and TAN as well. Yes, of course. The TDS requirement is mainly with the government authority. And those government authorities will be given a separate number by the GSTN. Because TDS, TCS is there for other people. But TDS requirement is only in respect of government authorities, uh, in respect of contracts which are supplied to the government the goods which are supplied to government, the government is supposed to deduct. And for that, there is a separate registration which government authorities will take. Is separate registration required for trading and manufacturing by same entity in one state? Well, there's only one registration per PAN required. You may be having a trading business or a manufacturing uh, activity, but all of this related to one PAN number, only one registration is required. Even though I am not liable to register, can I voluntarily seek registration? This has been answered. The answer to this is yes. Let's come to the next question. Can we use provisional uh, registration PID or do we get new GSTIN? Can we uh, start using PID till a new one is issued? I think that has also been answered. The PID will become the GSTIN. So yes, let's move on. This is an important point. Yes. Uh, uh, the people are confused about provisional ID and the uh, final ID. We have time and again said that the provisional ID will remain provisional only so long as you get final certificate of registration. But for all practical purpose, that will become your permanent ID also. So the same GSTI number has to be used by you in business throughout. 
the only thing which is required is that in order to convert provisional into final ID number, you have to give all the details and then once you give those details, the computer will generate a certificate of registration for you and that certificate of registration you have to display. Within 90 days, if provisional ID is not converted into certificate of registration, then that provisional ID will be discontinued. So people may like to note this, that yes, the same number will continue for life. So if you want to print your invoice book, your chalan book or your bill book, you can start printing them. That is the same number. It is not going to change. But within 90 days, you have to take the certificate of registration. Whether trader of country liquor is required to migrate to GST from VAT as liquor is out of GST law? Do you want to reply to this? Hmm. Uh, liquor is outside uh, GST. If he is only dealing in liquor, then he is not required to take registration. But I have migrated under GST but want to register as ISD, whether I can apply now and what is the procedure? Uh, yes, uh, there is separate requirement for registration of, for ISD. You have to apply again in uh, registration number one form and you have to say that I want a registration for ISD. ISD means input service distributor. So if you have got businesses where uh, uh, you have got accumulated credit in one place, then you can distribute your input tax credit to other units also. Now that person who does this is ISD. And ISD, for becoming an ISD, you have to take a separate registration number. So just on the portal, when you uh, go and choose purpose, there, it's, there is a one drop down menu is for ISD. And that you need to select that everything else remains the same. Okay. Is there an option to take centralized registration for services under GST law? Well, <coughs> under the GST law, as I explained, earlier we had only service tax, which was one single tax levied by Government of India only. Now, service tax is also shared with the state governments. So the power to levy service tax is with all the state government. So just as earlier, the good supplier if he was doing business in more than one state, he was registering on all the states where he was doing business. Similarly, in case of services also, if you are supplying services from one, more than one state, then you are supposed to take registration in that state. But as I explained, I would like to again re-emphasize that if you are supplying services sitting in one place to rest of the country, then you don't need to take registration in all the state. But if you are actually having a branch and you are billing from some other state and also having a place of business in some other state from where also you are uh, ful fulfilling your contracts or you are serving your customers, then in that state you have to take the registration. How long can I wait to register in uh, GST? I think uh, the entire procedure has been explained in detail. Then the other one is, uh, what if I have to make corrections in my registration details with regards to core fields and non-core fields also? An explanation was given, but Yes, you that is uh, available, and as uh, the Revenue Secretary has explained, the core fields, one has to make an application online after logging in, and for non-core fields, he can do himself. This facility will be available from 17th of uh, this month for both those who have enrolled and those who have newly registered. So again, the important announcement uh, here is that the facility to change the details of non-core field or core field, that will be available online from 17th of July. So a lot of people are getting impatient that I have made a mistake in putting some of the details. So when do I change it? And a lot of Twitter messages and emails are coming. So those people may please wait till 17th of July. After a week or so, it will open and then if you have to make an application for changing the core field, that is also available online. You make an application online, but it will go in the back end to the tax authority. And within seven days, either they will approve or they'll raise a query. And for non-core field, you can yourself change it. Instantaneously, it'll be accepted. I was a registered just, service just tax one, assessor. One more yes, thing I wanted to add. Whatever changes you make, the system will keep the old data with us so that all your past data and the new data both will be kept inside. Okay. I was a registered service tax assessee with an annual turnover of 12 lakh rupees. 
but I am now eligible for threshold exemption. Since I have migrated, do I become a taxable person? Well, if you migrated already, then you need to cancel it. So it is, there is a simple procedure involved in the GSTN website where you can go and cancel it. If you are not uh, above the threshold, if you are below the threshold and you want to cancel your migrated registration, you have to cancel it online. Will input uh, service distributor be required to be separately registered other than the existing taxpayer registration that has been answered that the registration will need to be done separately? Is there any system to facilitate smaller dealers or dealers having no IT infrastructure? Well, actually you don't need any infrastructure for the GST. A lot of misgivings are spreading all around that you need to have a computer all the time in your office. You need to generate invoices online, nothing like that. You can generate your invoices online. What First of all, you need registration. Now, as we explained, registration is a 15-minute procedure. And if you don't have a computer, you don't have knowledge of computer, you can take the services of an IT graduate who knows a little bit of computer. He knows how to go to GST website, what details to give. He will fill it up for you. So you can go to a cyber cafe or to an IT uh, graduate, and he will help you with that. You need one-time help. Then you need computer and internet only once for filing the return in a month and there also if you are a composite dealer the return filing for a composite dealer is only once in three months so you will need computer and internet only once in three months otherwise if you are not a composite dealer you are above that and you are a regular registered person then once in a month so uh, at the most you know when you want to see your purchases if you are a B2B type and you want to see your input tax credit also, then you will need twice. And third time, of course, for uh, f uh, finally clicking the return. So three times in a month is all that you need computer for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So, and still, if anybody has got any problem, we have requested our service tax, excise duty, VAT officers to function as GST Suvida provider, Suvida Kendras, and anybody can walk into these offices, there would be computer there. We have requested our officers to help them with filling up of registration details also. How will I as a citizen know if someone is registered under GST? Uh, every taxable person is required to display his GST number in his name board or sign board of the business. And he is also required to display his registration certificate in his business premises. So a citizen can easily find out whether the person is registered or not. In case of a composition dealer, he has also to mention that he is a composite composition dealer and he is not required to, and he is not uh, entitled to collect tax from the taxpayer. So that uh, is the legal requirement. So citizen can easily find out whether the person from whom he is buying is entitled to tell, collect tax from him or not. So if the person is a composition dealer, they need to have a sign board saying that they are in the composition scheme, is it? Scheme, yes. and uh, they are not supposed to collect the tax. It's very important because if you are unregistered dealer, you are not supposed to charge any tax in the bill that you give. The bill will be only the total uh, value of supply, in inclusive of taxes which have been paid in the input tax side. So you are not supposed to put any tax separately if you are unregistered dealer. And if you are a composite dealer, then also same thing. You are not supposed to put any taxation on the bill of, uh, uh, on your invoice. You call it bill of supply without any tax uh, calculation. So he will give the total bill of the total value. So some people may become impatient. Ke, I went to so-and-so dealer and he did not uh, add any tax. So that means ke, he has avoided GST. It's not like that. The GST would come to us at least up to the wholesaler stage. So GST would have come to us in any case. What we are exempt is, is, is only the GST on the retailer's margin. That is what we are exempting. And we are saying instead of that, the retailer will pay only 1% lump sum on the turnover for the composite dealer. That is what we are saying. Okay. So people should not get confused. The small retailers who are in composition scheme, they may not give you a bill with tax detail, the 12% GST, 18% GST. But don't get confused. This is for the public in general. Okay. Who are the persons for whom special provisions of registration are made? I already mentioned it, the TDS, the TCS, okay. 
casual lab, casual taxable person, etc. You know, those are the special. Uh, also for the UN specialized agency, but this is not of importance to general public. Mm -hmm. What if my rental income is five lakh rupees and I'm providing exempt service of eighteen lakh rupees in a year? Will I be liable to register? As we have seen, the liability to register arises in a normal case if my threshold is about 20 lakhs. This 20 lakhs uh, include all supplies, whether for export, exempted, taxable, or non-taxable. In this case, the exempted supplies of 18 lakhs and taxable supplies of 5 lakhs. The total becomes 23 lakhs since the aggregate uh, supply is more than 20 lakhs, he is required to take registration. Also, when it comes to rental income, let me tell you that rental income received from individual residential house, that is exempted. But if you have given your unit to a commercial enterprise, then it is taxable. So if you are getting more than 20 lakhs of rent from a commercial unit, if you have given it for commercial purpose, for a shop or for an office, and if your income, rental income is more than 20 lakhs per annum, then you are supposed to register and pay the tax. Provisional ID not received, how do I find it? Yeah, so as I explained earlier, uh, provisional ID is created by the GST system based on uh, request which comes from the tax department uh, with tin and the pan. And the tax department only distributes. So they, they have adopted two modes. Majority of uh, the tax departments, they keep it on their portal. So once they log in like service tax pay, he logs in on his uh, service tax portal, he sees that this is the new provisional ID for him and the token and from there itself he can go. In few states they have given uh, by hand as well. So in case someone hasn't got it and he was registered earlier with VAT or service tax or the central excise, he needs to contact his tax authority immediately. Provisional ID has been cancelled. What do I do to get it activated? Uh, yeah. me, can you just repeat, sorry? Provisional ID has been cancelled. Yes. What do I do to get it activated? Okay, so the cancellation also happens on the request of the tax department. Sometime back, uh, almost two months back, uh, some of the tax departments took a drive and cancelled the TIN of those who had not filed their returns for many periods. So that number was around five and a half lakh, and uh, later on those people represented, they filed, and majority of them have been restored. So the, my advice to such taxpayers is they should go back to the portal of their old department, a tax department, and check. In most of the cases, it has been restored. If it is not stored, the tax, that tax department will uh, get it done. My PAN has changed. How do I get it incorporated in provisional ID? Uh, this has happened in case uh, a person who was proprietor and he is no more and then this, the, the concern or the firm passes on to his son or daughter. So in that case, the PAN gets changed. So this request again has to be uh, accepted by the tax department, that VAT tax department or the service tax as the case may be. And that request comes to us. So what we do, we uh, cancel the old one because GST identification number is based on PAN. So if PAN changes, your GS TIN also gets changed. So the process is uh, they need to contact the tax department. And we have done uh, quite a number of such cases where uh, uh, the PAN has changed. Other case of PAN changes where uh, a partnership, they decide to convert it into a company or vice versa. So only the tax authority who was earlier assessing them, they have to first confirm that yes, there is a requirement of PAN change. And then that comes to us, and then the, the process followed is cancel the old one and give a new one. After submission of application, I got validation error. What do I do now? This has also been answered. No, but let me explain, error. taking a minute here, because uh, lots of people think uh, that once I have submitted, so once you submit your details, all the details, and you sign using DSC or EVC, you get a message called success. Now that success is of signature, that you have successfully signed and submitted. And as I explained earlier, the PAN of all the promoters authorized signatories, in case of directors, the SIN DIN as well, 
these are then validated with CBDT. Now this process takes time, we do it in batches, it is not done instantaneously. So almost an, uh, every hour this batch is run. And in case any validation fails, like PAN doesn't match or uh, SIN or DIN doesn't match, then uh, error is given and also an email is sent uh, to the taxpayer. So all he needs to do is to read that email and go back, log in and make ne necessary changes, give the name as per the PAN of that particular promoter or authorized signatory, wherever it has failed. Another related question is, not able to sign in with uh, DSC, Digital Signature Certificate, is there any other mechanism to authenticate? Yes, uh, some first time when people uh, install the DSC, it's a, quite a tedious, long process. But the good part is, more than 24 lakh people have already done it in our country. Now, what government has also done, they have uh, allowed signing or authentication of registration form using EVC, which is nothing but an OTP which comes on your registered mobile number. So you just put that, so that's the EVC, the third one which is available for signing and I will request all to use that. However, this is not available to companies, LLPs and FL, foreign LLPs. A related question, OTP not received, what to do? So this happens OTP uh, because of many factors, including the telecom service provider, where you are, which building you are. So there is a, another button there, regenerate OTP. So that is what we need, one needs to do, to press that and be in a place where you get signal. There are lots of places, even in Delhi, where you don't get mobile signal. So if the mobile signal is not there, you will not get OTP. I mean, this happens when you are doing banking services also. From where can I get the registration certificate? So uh, the provisional certificate based on enrollment of around 69 lakh uh, taxpayer was generated, sent by email. It's also available on the dashboards. But the dashboard is once you log in, then only you can see. And there is a service under the services sector, there is a view, download the certificates. So you can download it from there. Similarly for final registration certificate, in case of new registration, that's also available there. What can I do in case a query is raised to me in response to my online application for registration? You have already explained that. So while explaining the process of registration, I had mentioned that the officer, when he looks at the registration application, so he goes through all the details which have been fi uh, filed or submitted about the promoters, principal place of business, additional place of business, etc. Now in case of place of business, they look at the lease deed. How did you lease deed or there are other uh, documents which are provided. So if, as I had explained earlier, if the le lease deed is old, it has already expired or it's not legible. Now in those cases, you will ask for additional information. So these are some of the cases where uh, additional information or the new lease deed will be asked. And the taxpayer gets seven working days, which means leaving aside Saturday, Sunday and holidays to provide that application again electronically on the same portal. So he doesn't need to go anywhere, he just he needs to log in and upload the new document. Suppose it's a le new lease deed, he has to just simply upload that and it will go automatically to the tax officer who will get now seven days to uh, yes, take a decision. Yeah. One thing is uh, the officer can raise queries only once. He cannot do, do it in piecemeal basis, like one query at a time. All the queries have to be re raised in one go and all the replies are provided in one go. I deal in uh, more than five items, whereas form allows only five items for HSN code wise entry. What do I do? I think that has already been mentioned that five uh, major items uh, this, need to be mentioned. This and is not a very all. common question asked by many, you know, whether form only allows five items of your uh, trading or manufacturing to be entered. Doesn't matter, you may be manufacturing or trading in hundreds of items. We want five main items to come there. Okay, so that is all that you can do. You can uh, still, it doesn't mean that you can, you cannot trade in other items, you can still do it. Okay. Authorized signatory of tax practitioner is not sharing user ID and password. What to do? This is a very tricky question, you know. Sometimes we trust our tax practitioners and uh, they get the mobile number and password, uh, they get the login and password. And when we want to do it ourselves, they don't want to part with it unless we pay some fees or etc. 
this should not normally happen but if it happens then you have to go to your tax authority and say that please generate a new login and id for me the tax authority has to send the request to gstn and gstn will have to give you new login and password so this is the only possibility that we have we can open the floor for questions though we have more questions on social media if anyone has a question they may raise their hand and the mic may be passed to them okay yeah सर एक सवाल मेरा है कि किसी ट्रेडर के पास आप जाते हैं इंग्लिश दिस इज अ क्लास फॉर इंग्लिश सो मे बी नेक्स्ट टाइम हिंदी वी हैव फिनिश्ड या से ओके नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट प्लीज पास इट ऑन एंड देयर वाज अ क्वेरी दैट इन केस ऑफ अ सर्विस प्रोवाइडर टेक्स अ रजिस्ट्रेशन माइग्रेट टू जीएसटी एंड एंड हिज टर्न ओवर इज 12 लाख एंड ही डजंट कैंसिल इट and he uh, goes with it so he will have to pay the service tax uh, now the gst on 12 lakhs also yes if you remain registered if you stay registered then naturally the liability to file return and liability to pay tax comes so that is why i mentioned that those who are migrated earlier and they have also successfully generated a provisional certificate of registration they should cancel it they should not wait they should cancel it right away if they don't want to remain okay second question is that there was a query that if 18 lakhs is the uh, exempted turnover and 5 lakhs is that uh, taxable turnover he will have to take a registration so on that 5 uh, uh, lakhs he will have to pay the gst and gst no not on the uh, exempt turnover his not tax on the exempt turnover no his tax lab he, he has to register if his taxable as well as exempt turnover is more than 20 lakhs right but the tax payment liability is only on the taxable uh commodity except in case of composition in case of composition you have to pay total the turnover tax on the total uh total uh, turnover thank you uh, sir myself arjun this pay from uni uh, suppose someone was uh, providing some services and he was earning around 7 to 8 lakhs earlier he had to uh, file uh, he had to pay the service tax now the limit is uh, tw uh, 20 lakhs and he is still earning 10 lakhs or 8 lakhs like that then is it uh, compulsory for him or her to migrate to gst or uh, he should uh, he or she should do nothing no no look first of all also earlier also under service tax also the exemption limit was 10 lakhs but suppose his turnover is now between 10 and 20 also then also if he is already migrated then he has to cancel it but it is not compulsory for him to register he any other cannot, questions he, he need not no voluntarily he can register but he need not yeah okay there's uh, one person who wants to ask a question there sir i am a registered service uh, provider uh, i want to register as a uh, gst practitioner so is it possible for me to go for the two registration together i am providing from delhi only no the registration for tax practice now see both okay. are separate so yeah. one is as a provide prov provider of services and the second is as a practitioner yes so practitioner you are not registering you are enrolling there is a subtle difference okay. as a law person you will understand whereas okay. as a service provider you are getting registered and then you have will have liability to pay uh, taxes gst i am already paying taxes but i uh, but uh, can i club uh, the uh, gst practitioner in my services no no you can't for registering enrolling as a practitioner gst practitioner there is a separate registration procedure available online okay that is also now uh, going to be available from 17 yes sir. july so it was it is to be available from 17 july so you can register enroll as a tax practitioner there is a separate thing after enrolling if your total turnover is more than 20 lakhs in a year then you should also register separately as a dealer as a service tax uh, practitioner you know so you can you have to register under gst in you have to take a gst in number also in the other one you will get an enrollment number okay 
We won't be able to take uh, any more questions uh, because that's all the time that we have uh, for this. So uh, we'll thank you, uh, Mr. Adia, Mr. Jade, and Mr. Kumar for having joined us for this session. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be joining you live at 4.30 p.m. on Doordarshan Network as well as on the various uh, social media handles of uh, PIB. That is on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook. And you can also watch the live webcast tomorrow as well on uh, pib.nic.in. That is the website of the PIB. Tomorrow, the topic will be transition and invoice making. So if you have any questions, tweet with hashtag AskAdia. Thank you so much for watching.